Alrighty, Luke chapter number 24. We're going to begin reading in verse number 36, but prior to verse number 36, we find the account of the men on the road to Emmaus, and as they were walking, Jesus comes up to them and then starts preaching about Jesus, which would have been a message that I would have liked to have heard. But as they're going along the way, eventually they get to a place to stop. They go in, Jesus breaks bread, and when he broke the bread, it became known unto them that he was Christ. Okay, then... Immediately, they run back to Jerusalem. Okay, where all the other disciples and where the soon-to-be apostles are. And then, as that happens, they're telling them, hey, we saw Jesus. He, he really is rose from the dead. Okay, now, verse number 36. And as they, those men on the road to Emmaus, thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that for repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, why did we read all them verses? Well, first off, a few things that struck me. Anybody remember? I don't know. When was it? I mean, two years ago? I can't remember. But the Lord had his teach on three days and three nights. What well, was one of the things in those three days and three nights that Christ did? He remade the body of Christ. Because they, being the Romans that crucified him, had destroyed the body that he had worn for some 33 and a half years and he remade it but in that remaking process he left out some things for instance look in verse number 39 behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have what's he saying look at the nail prints take a look it's the proof he left the holes in his hands and in his feet and the wound in his side where they speared him. And the Bible says that water and blood came forth and then the centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. Surely that man was a little bit different. Well, why did he keep those things? He didn't keep them for his benefit. He was Christ. He's God. He didn't need to keep the nail prints. In the hand. It's not like God was you know, limited in his power to where he couldn't remove those nail prints. No, that's not it at all. Why did he do it? For the same reason that Thomas asked, until I see, until I put my finger in those holes, I'm not going to believe. But why does he show them here? He says, hey, stop being foolish. I'm not a spirit. Look, it's really me. I'm not a ghost. I've got flesh and blood. Why did Christ leave the nail print? It's proof. As I'm sitting there reading it, I mean, back in the day, they weren't as good as they are nowadays with modern-day makeup and cosmetics and wigs and everything else, but they did have body doubles. And I can see the Jews now, skeptical, full of rage that this, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, and if he didn't have the nail prints, if he didn't have the signs that he had hung on the cross, they would have said, well, we killed the wrong guy. That wasn't Jesus, this is Jesus. And the guy that was crucified last time, they must have you know, hired somebody that looked like him 
to stand in his place. Like is it, but no, he left him there for proof. And then here's, here's the really. He's got the wounds, but he's not bleeding. I mean, do you really think that Christ, who took on the form of a servant so that he could be glorified in due time, would go and just, show, one, show up in the middle of somebody's house, didn't say he came in the door, he just was in the midst. He was just there. That's probably why they thought he was a spirit, because they're like, we've never seen anybody do that before. But, just show up at somebody's house and start bleeding all over the place? No. His blood was already on the mercy seat in heaven. Just further proof. It's me. I'm real. Touch me. Did he not say? He said, Behold my hands and my feet that it handle me and see. In other words, touch. Can't touch the spirit. Can't touch me. And then to go one step further. He says, Have you anything to eat? Do you really think that Christ was hungry? Or do you think that he was trying to prove to him that if I can take a bite out of this broiled fish and this honeycomb, you're going to know that I'm not some ghostly apparition. That if, I, if you hand me something and I can pick it up, I'm not a spirit. Because the verse before that, he's in verse number 41, and while they yet believed not for joy, they were still a little skeptical. They were saying, well, he sounds like him, he looks like him. We can't really see through him, so he might be real. But it's not like uh, those things down at, uh, what is it, Haunted Mansion at Disney World. Right? From one angle you could see him, but then a different angle you can't. When you're on the ride. He said, well, we can, we can kind of see him all the time. Maybe they were a little hesitant to go and touch him. So then he says, all right, stop doubting. Because what did he tell Thomas over in the book of John? He didn't want him to be found faithless. He said, come on, touch and see. Thomas already said, nope, you're Lord. He said, no, 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 I want you to do it. Because I don't want the back of your mind or Satan to come in and put a thought in your mind and say, well, you never really did touch him. You really don't know if that was him. Could have had a fever dream one day. Right? Or what do they call it? Mass hysteria, where people believe something even though it didn't happen. And they'll all swear that it really did happen. Right? Not that. He's saying, no, touch and see. You may believe right now, but I want you to be found not faithless. I don't want one day for your faith to be stolen away from you, so I want you to submit it right now. That's what he's doing here. He's saying, give me food. And they're like, okay, here you go. And then he ate it, and they're like, okay, that's him. Right, but why was all that important that they believe? Because until they believed, he couldn't continue on. Until they were found without doubt. Until they were absolutely sure in themselves, he couldn't get to verse number 44. It says, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. What was the point for Jesus showing himself to thousands of witnesses after he rose again? To continue to teach them. To continue to prepare them for his final ascension into heaven. To prepare them to be patient to receive the Holy Ghost. And then once they did receive the Holy Ghost, to finally go out and do what he said. Now if we get a little bit different version here. But we do find a great commission. He said, And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Well, the verse that most people like to quote is the great commission is that going to all the world. Right? But then, starting at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the utmost part of the earth, and every living creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, they still had some things to learn. They would have been lacking. Not because it was God's fault. He said already, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. He's saying, I told you this was going to happen. And y'all still shocked. This wasn't the first time that he showed up to them either. They're still a little wary. 
Okay, maybe in the back of their mind, but did that really happen? Was I dreaming? And they're so filled with doubt, they're not going to talk to somebody else about it and say, you know, hey, did, did Jesus really show up yesterday? No, because they're like, well, if it did happen, I don't want to look like a dumb one. But he had to get all the doubt out of them to where they fully exercised their faith. Okay, I really do believe that's him. Today he could go on to remind them. He had already taught them, but he's reminding them. And then he goes on and says, all those things which were fulfilled. Then he starts with, written in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms concerning Christ. Well, what's he doing? He's connecting dots for them. He's saying, you remember when the psalmist wrote that my bones stare up at me? He goes, that was about me. He says, you remember over in the book of Malachi where it starts talking about Bethlehem, Judah? Naming it as the place of my birth? He goes, that, yeah, that was talking about me. And then he goes on and on and on and on. Connecting the dots for them so that they, after he is gone, can stand and give an account of these things to other people. I mean, we can go and look just in the book of Acts. We can look at what preacher, Peter preached at the day of Pentecost. What's he doing? He's going back to the prophets. He's going back to Moses. He's going back to the Psalms and the things that were prophesied and showing all those that were listening... He was the one that God said he would send. Because they had a hard time receiving Jesus, but guess what those scribes and Pharisees really held on to? The things that God had delivered in the past. And that's what they taught to the people. That God used to speak, but God hadn't had a prophet in a while. Because before Christ came on the scene, 400 years of silence from God concerning Israel. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God said, I've told you all everything you need to know. It's either you're going to believe it or you're not. And some of them did believe the right way. Because some of them were looking for a Savior. Some of them were looking for the Messiah. And some of them recognized Him when He showed up. Even those from the Far East. Those Magi, as they might call them. Right? Or the three kings, even though we don't know how many of them there were. We just know there's more than one. They knew the scriptures, and when they saw a new star, they said, Hey, something's happening over that way. Let's go find out. And they knew that it was going to be a king that they were looking for, because they brought gifts fit for a king. They didn't come unprepared. They knew who they were coming to see. See, they paid a lot of attention to those things which were written down. And Christ is explaining to them, all of them were talking about me. So that when Peter gets up on the day of picket, or we can go and look at Stephen as he starts preaching. What's he start telling them? He's saying, your ancestors were stiff-necked, uncircumcised to heart. They couldn't even believe when God was doing miracles in front of them. And yet, now the God himself walked among you and you still don't believe him. He starts talking about the things that were done in old times to show that Christ was going to come one day. But see, they wouldn't have been able to receive that lesson unless they fully believed it was Him. If they doubted in the back of their mind, it might have been a little bit of hesitancy when somebody stood up and said, hey, first we're going to beat you, then we're going to throw you in prison, then we're going to bring you before a council and tell you not to preach about Jesus anymore, and then for good measure, probably beat you again before we let you go. If you're going through that and there's a seed of doubt, it's going to grow. If you're going through that and there's a hint in the back of your mind that, oh, maybe they're right. Maybe I got this wrong. If there's a seed there, it has, there's always the opportunity that it can grow, that it can fester. And Jesus is saying, no, we've got to wipe all that out. And so here's, here's what we're going to be teaching on this morning, verse number 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And then he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
Now see, when Jesus taught them beforehand, you can go back in any of the Gospels and look at what he taught them right before he went to Jerusalem for his action. He said the time has almost come, or it is time, for him to be glorified. Now we think glorified, we think something good's about ready to happen. And yeah, something good really did happen. He died for our sins and he rose from the dead. But see, that's why Peter's thinking, well, if he's getting ready to be glorified, he's getting ready to go sit on the throne of David. If he's getting ready to be glorified, he's getting ready to set up his reign. He truly is going to reign now as Messiah. But see, in the eyes of God, the Son got more glory, not only for himself, but also for the Father, by first being crucified, then rising from the dead, because he could redeem fallen man by the shedding of his blood. And everyone that trusts in Christ brings glory unto God. Because they say, I don't want the world, I want God. And I want the Son of God. And I believe that he was who he said he was, that he did what he said he did, and that he can save me like he said he would. It is a denial of self, it's a denial of the world, when you receive salvation. And any time that man gets smaller and the world is rejected, God gets glory. But see, that didn't make sense to them when he was preaching it beforehand. Because glorified means raised up. Raised up high. To have honor and praise given unto him. But they didn't understand that first he had to descend into the earth before God would glorify him. I mean, he already gave him a name that was above every other name. But that was a name worthy of the position that he would have. Well, technically he already had it. It was the Son of God. But as Redeemer, that's why he has a name that's above every other name. Because every other name doesn't have any hope for you. It took a name that was first come up with by God, delivered by an angel because man wouldn't have come up with it on his own. And even though God told them beforehand it would mean Emmanuel, God with us, they didn't get it when Jesus showed up on the scene. Okay, now, all of that, he's teaching to them, thus is written, it behooved Christ to suffer. In other words, it was profitable for Christ to suffer. It was pleasing unto God for Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day. Now they're seeing it from the other side. They're saying, oh, he already had all glory and all honor because, I mean, we can go and read that without him nothing was created and by him do all things consist. That he was God. He couldn't have been glorified any more than he already, I mean, his thrones on the sides of the north. There's nothing above him. The earth is footstool. But it's not talking about raised up to another position. It means recognized that we're glorified. Recognized as who he really is. I mean, what's a, you know, let's say, a local politician to the president? Right? Oh, you're in charge of a couple of neighborhoods? Right? I mean, what's a manager at McDonald's to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company? He said, oh, you want to give me a little bit of advice? But in that show, anybody ever see that show, Undercover Boss, where I'm convinced that it's all scripted? Because if I'm looking at it and saying, there's no way that that's real hair, the person sitting there on the other side is thinking the same thing. I mean, I saw one episode where this lady was wearing pearls about that big around on her neck, even though she's got a wig on and she's got, you know, different makeup and glasses on. And you're applying for a job that does nine fifty an hour, and you got pearls on there worth more than the building that you're sitting in. Right? It's pr pretty easy to pick them out. But how many people didn't recognize Christ as Christ when he walked the earth? It brought glory, or it glorified Christ to do something that nobody else could do. Because even back in Moses' day, God would send a plague, 
or God would do a sign and then the sorcerers and magicians of Pharaoh would come and say well we can do something like that too and Pharaoh wouldn't believe and there were those that had communal I mean go back and listen to this series that we did on spiritual warfare we don't have time to redo all of it right here right now but there are spirits that do have some power in this world and they can do things I mean, we can go to the book of look at Simon. I mean, he was preaching on not too long ago. Okay, Simon trying to buy the things of God, bargain with the men of God. The Bible said he got saved, but he still was looking for a way that he could get something that other people didn't have to use it for his own gain. Because that's what he did as a sorcerer. Right, there are ways to show that you have power in this world. But in order for people to recognize him as Christ, he said, no, no, no. I have all power over death and hell and to prove it to you in order to be recognized as Christ by many more people because he preached and many believed but many did not and we won't know until we get to heaven how many that didn't believe while he preached and walked on the earth believed after he got up out of the grave because he got up out of the grave he was glorified as Christ he was already glorified as God and couldn't get any higher but there were still those that didn't believe and wouldn't believe until he did what he did. And they didn't understand that at first because they were thinking carnally. They weren't thinking spiritually. But, in verse number 45, then he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. He's saying, you've heard it. You saw it. You've seen everything that I've done. But let me open up your understanding. In other words, let me blow your mind so that you can understand how long God planned this and has been telling people that such things would happen. And then he goes all the way back to Moses. He could have gone all the way back to the garden when he told the serpent that you'll bruise his heel, but he'll bruise your head. But in the law, He's saying, this is what it takes to be acceptable in the sight of God. Nobody ever did it but Christ. Then he starts going through the prophets. Major and minor both. All of them that were given visions by God or messages by God that said, one day he's going to send a Redeemer, the Messiah. And then, he says, you know, the Psalms, but then, he also starts piecing together the things that he had done and he said that's why I did those things that's why we did those things that way when y'all were wondering and couldn't figure out why we did it that way it was to fulfill the scriptures to do everything and then by the time he was done they understood everything that they needed to about why Jesus did things the way that he did them they understood how to tell other people and to prove to other people using what God had given in the past, which, hang on a second here, given, you know, about that much of the Bible, taking that and going through in the temple and saying, excuse me, Rabbi, can you uh, tell me what you're reading today? Oh, book of Isaiah? That's a great. You want to talk about how he's going to be born of a virgin? Because he was. And you want to talk about how he was born in Bethlehem? He was. You want to talk about how he would open the blinded eyes of those that were blind from birth? Because only God could do that. And guess what? He did it. And then they could now explain to others. Because they believed he was the Son of God, but how do you tell somebody else that he was? Explain it to them. Now granted, we have the benefit of the whole counsel of God. The Bible's been completed. No more signs and wonders. Because that's why the apostles had signs and wonders. Because we'll prove that you are associated with that guy. Okay. And all the great things that the apostles did was not because, you know, man is not enough to go out and share the gospel. It's that people at that time, until it was finished, until everything that God wanted written down, he needed them to have proof. And even if there was a full copy, let's say there was one in Jerusalem, 
What are you going to do if you're Philip just walking down the road and there's a man from Ethiopia sitting in a chariot? chariot. He's only got part of the Bible. How are you going to prove to that man? But luckily, God had already been working on that guy. And he believed. He was already studying the scriptures. He was in the right spot, but he could not understand those scriptures because his understanding had not been opened. Well, how does God do that nowadays? Through the Holy Spirit. I don't care how long you've been saved. There's a part of the Bible that God wants you to look at today. And he wants to show you that verse and open your understanding in a new way. It may have been something you've read before. It may have been something you've heard preached on time after time. But up until that point, you were not prepared to have your understanding opened to where you could receive out of that verse what God wanted you to receive. And why does he want you to receive it? To prepare you for today. Because today's the day that the Lord has made. Tomorrow's not here. May never come. Yesterday's gone. But God had something for you to do today other than come to church and sit on a pew. Certainly, it's the will of God. Doors are open. It's the will of God that everybody who's a member of the Emmanuel Baptist Church should be here. But there's empty seats right now. Then there might be a whole lot less empty seats here in a little bit. But I guarantee you there's going to be more empty seats tonight. But I'm not talking about that will of God. I'm talking about outside of these walls. God wants you to do something for Him today. Amen. How am I supposed to know what God wants me to do unless He opens up my understanding? Unless He takes the Scriptures and then shows me. It's not just saying it's the will of the church to go. Or it's the will of the pastor or it's the will of God for the pastor to do this, or for the church to do that, or for talking about globally, for God's people to do something. No, 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 no. It's God's will for Jordan to do something. It's God's will for Brother Clint to do something. Right? Or Naj to do something. Till he opens your understanding and makes it personal. You're not going to have it rooted deep down in your heart. They'd already heard it, but it wasn't a part of them. God hadn't opened their understanding, or maybe he had to open their understanding here because they weren't asking the right questions back before. But Lord, how are you going to be glorified? Because Jesus told Peter, I'm going to be delivered in the hands of evil men. Peter, I'm going to die. He said, not so, Lord. How do you tell God that God's lying? It's impossible for him to lie. But Peter's saying, that no, it can't be. You're God. I can't kill God. But maybe he should have been saying, well, Lord, how is you being delivered in the hands of going to glorify you? Maybe he'd have had the answer beforehand. Maybe instead of three days and three nights of hiding up, boarded in the house, fearing for his life, he'd be saying, no, it's going to be okay. He's going to get up again. He said if they destroy that temple in three days, he'd build it back up again. You remember when he preached that? Now, I will say, Peter was one of those that was, when he heard the news, he was willing to go investigate. John outran him, but Peter was the second one on the scene after Mary Magdalene came back and said, hey, he's gone. He got up. I saw him. He said he's coming back later today to talk to y'all. And he said, Peter, he wants you to be there. And Peter took off running. He says, okay, something's about ready to happen. I knew he was God, but I didn't know what he was going to do. But now i, I, I got to go see what he did. Because they kept their understanding closed. Because they were saying, okay, I get it. Got it, Lord. Let's cross that off the list. And God's saying, nope, you're still missing something. Or maybe instead of not asking the right questions, maybe... You weren't prepared yet. Maybe the time had not come to where you had learned and matured as God wanted you to, to where you could receive the next lesson. Okay, Wednesday night, Pastor preached on Benaya in that pit on a snowy day about your pits not being or becoming pitfalls. Right? Benaya, when he went up to that Egyptian, he went to him with a staff. And he plucked the spear up out of his hand and flew him with his own spear. Okay, you do not just one day get handed a staff and say, okay, go do that. 
Right? He trained for many years, which was part of the message. But see, when you get to a certain point, like Benaiah, it doesn't matter if you've got a staff in your hand, if you've got a spear in your hand, whatever you've got, you've been trained to know how to use it. But he didn't start off with plucking spears out of somebody's hands with a staff. He started off drilling with one weapon. Then maybe with a different weapon. Might have been start off with a spear. Then he might have gone to a sword. Might have been trained in a bow. But you have to prove mastery over one thing until you can receive the next thing. Otherwise, you're just going to be mediocre at two things. And God does not expect or accept mediocre servants. And it's required among stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful to what? Do what God wants us to do, but receive what God wants us to receive. So if we hear something preached, if when we're reading something, instead of just saying, well, I know what that means. I get that. I've heard that before. Maybe ask the Lord, Lord, open my understanding. Because you wouldn't have it preached. You wouldn't point it out to me when I'm studying your word. You wouldn't keep bringing it to my mind when I'm praying if there wasn't something there that you wanted me to see. So open my understanding. Show me. The Bible still does say, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which gives all men liberally. If you truly do seek after what God wants you to know, he'll open your understanding. Because where were these disciples? They were gathered together, continuing in what Christ had taught them. They were where they were supposed to be, and they had heard before the things that Christ had told them, but they needed to hear again and then have it or have their understanding open to what they heard. To where the light bulb finally came on and it clicked. I can stand up here until I either pass out or, you know, get really hungry and need to go eat and try and explain the same thing to you over and over and over again. I can try it from this angle, that angle, with every type of analogy or metaphor. I could do every object lesson that man has ever come up with, but unless God opens your understanding, you're not going to get it the way that God wants you to get it. That's why it's not about who's behind the pulpit. It's about if the person behind the pulpit is hooked up with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost can do a work through that person. Man, look at on the outward appearance. I don't know if y'all notice. I mean, used to the devil tried to bother me with it. But now, you know, he stopped bothering me. But I guess he figured out I'm pretty hard-headed. But people, during Sunday school, don't do a lot of shouting. When I do preaching, most of the time, people don't do a lot of shouting. You know what I've come to find out? If people are quiet, it usually means they're thinking. And if they're thinking... They're not thinking about what I've said because everything I'm saying is coming right from here. They're thinking about what God said. And if they're thinking, that usually means the Holy Ghost is saying, hey, you need to pay attention. Amen. I'd rather it be quiet and every now and then Brother Clint say amen or Brother Brian, but Tommy, that's usually the, the general three, but Tony, every now and then. Right? I'm okay with that as long as somebody's understanding has been opened by the Holy Spirit. I'm okay if I get up here, read a verse, and then God said, hey, this is what God said to say, one line, and then sit down. If that's what God wants, I'm fine with that. But the point behind it is, it's not about, I lean not undo your own understanding. Don't rely upon what we can get out of it. Rely on what God wants to show us out of it. Because once we get that, he's going to show us something different and different and different. Why? To make us more into the image of Christ, conform us more to his image. Maybe that means he's going to open up my understanding and show me that, hey, that thing that he's been permissive of so far, I need to let go of it. Or maybe it's going to be, hey, you know all those things that I've showed you? Well, you've learned everything you need to go to go tell that person. Because they were going to ask you this question or that question, and before you didn't have the answer, but now you do. Or, hey, that storm's been coming on the horizon for a while, you just haven't seen it yet. 
But because your understanding has been open, you're ready to go down into that pit and it's not going to be a pitfall. You're ready to face that lion on a snowy day and you're not going to be overcome because you've been equipped, you've been trained, and your understanding has been open so that you can go and do it. Because if you don't understand it, you can't go and do it. You could try, but the arm of flesh will fail you. And if you lean on your own understanding, you're going to do it the wrong way or you're going to do it out of God's timing. But if he opens your understanding, you know exactly what God wants you to do, when he wants you to do it, and how he wants you to do it. But if we're guessing, we're liable to be like Peter. Not so, Lord. We're liable to be like Thomas. Nope, not until I see. Not until I put my finger in those wounds am I going to believe. We're liable to be like some of them disciples. Hey, you want to hang around the house of God and talk about the things of God today? Nope, we're going fishing. But if our understanding is open, I don't need to be on that boat. Jesus suffered them to show up on the side of the sea. He knew they were going to be there. He already had fish on the shore when he told them to catch that fish. They were going to eat whether they caught anything or not. But why did he do it? Because Peter's still beating himself up and he says, Peter, I love you. Gave you all this fish. What do you think the early church survived off of for a long time? If it wasn't the fish that they caught eating it, they sold it, and they lived off of that money for a little bit. Because for a while, Jesus took care of everything, including their taxes. He pulled a fish out, opened the fish up. There's money in the fish. Pay their taxes. Why? Because they were totally dependent on them. He's still saying, I've still got you. But come over to the... Peter, you need to have your understanding open so that you understand I want you to go out there and feed my sheep, feed my lambs. See, if we're in the right place, if we're doing the right thing, if we're willing to set aside our doubtfulness, fully believing, and we sit down and we listen, not with the ears, not with the head, but listen with the heart, really get what he's trying to tell us, then he's liable to open up our understanding and show us exactly what we've been looking for. Because before this passage, Christ went away and the disciples running around everywhere. They didn't know what to do, full of fear, full of doubt. After this, you don't find the apostles, you don't find those that were the closest to Christ ever doubting again. Even when some of them faced the same death that he faced. No, no doubt. Why? He opened their understanding. He completed the work in them so that they could go do what he wanted them to do. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.